Hey folks, Cam Rogers coming at you from Fan Central here in Atlanta. It's Chat Sports Facebook Live and the Cam Rogers Show is coming at you with some fun interviews. Rachel Lindsay, the Bachelorette. We've got excited fans here. You can hear them right now. And the Cam Rogers Show starts now. Hey folks, Cam Rogers coming at you here at Chat Sports Facebook Live. It is a special Sunday edition of the Cam Rogers Show. We are taking you up until 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I am live from the Georgia World Congress Center getting you set for the college football playoff national championship game. Alabama and Georgia doing battle tomorrow night. I'm here at Playoff Fan Central. The excitement is building. I can feel it around me. I'm sure you at home can feel it too. So get those comments coming in as we are live. We'll show them throughout the broadcast as we see fit. Follow me on Twitter at Mr. Rogers 99 A fun show on tap for you. Plenty of interviews. Some NFL highlights, of course. The playoffs are going on right now. Playoffs for college football and the NFL, which is really fun at that. So, without any further ado, let's get to our first interview here on the program. Mark Kestesher, ESPN radio host, joining me now. He's doing the pre-game, halftime, and post-game coverage for the game tomorrow night. Mark, appreciate the time, sir. How are we doing? Cam, it's good to be on with you, and it's exciting to be here with, uh, with all the fans. You know, oftentimes, uh, for what I do on, on radio, you know, we're, um, we do the game, we do the uh, program surrounding in and around the game, and oftentimes it doesn't deal with the uh, the fans yeah. who we know are listening to the broadcast wherever they may be. So it's nice to interact. It's nice to get out, and good to be on your show. Can't you just hear the play-by-play -play as he talks? <laughs> you got to love it. So, Mark, a lot of excitement in this game. You have so many storylines. Smart, former assistant for Nick Saban. You know, Alabama, been there, done that so many times. What storylines stick out to you? Well, I think the... Um, the head coaching storylines certainly stick out, but moreover to me in that Kirby Smart, he knew in a smart way that he was going to take what Nick Saban did and try to build that model at Georgia. And he, he, he didn't take it over a program that needed a complete rebuild. It was a team that was you know winning 9, 10 games a year anyway, but needed to get over that hump. And so he said, well, look what Alabama did. That's where I just worked the last nine years. Let's see if we can do it under that system. Big lines, big offensive linemen, big defensive linemen, strong running game. And so to me, the fascinating point will be in a short turnaround, since they both played a week ago, Georgia had to travel all the way across the country. Uh, Alabama had the later game and had to stay overnight in New Orleans and come back, which is, um, will there be any big plays, fake punt, onside kick? Maybe we're not going to get that, and it's just going to be strength against strength, yep. running game. So I, I think... Um, even, it'll be fascinating to see how the rest of the country sees this, even though it's, it's an SEC game in SEC country right here in Atlanta. But to have two really good teams go head-to-head -head in what they do so well in formats that were built largely mirrored uh, to me is fascinating. You know what's fascinating, Mark, is we're actually looking at Alabama and going into the playoff you know, they had this chip on their shoulder because everybody thought they didn't belong in the first place, right? It should have been Ohio State. All the right. prognosticators out there said the Buckeyes should have gotten in. Alabama got in instead, and it's odd to say that they actually have a chip on their shoulder because they're always the favorite, so it's kind of a different dynamic now this it's year. It's almost not fair because right. uh, they probably in any other situation would be, and they are, you're right, they are the betting favorite. And I think when you look at these two teams, giving Alabama that second chance, if you want to call it that, by allowing them in despite not uh, winning their conference championship, uh, you don't want to give a team like Alabama a second chance because they're as good as any team in college football. Uh, sure, they lost the game to Auburn, so they lost out of a chance to play for the SEC championship, but it's a team that's as good as any in the, in the country. Uh, when they were being depleted in their linebacking core toward the end of the season, Guys that were filling in, you know, were five-star recruits. So much depth. Yeah, that hadn't, they didn't have, they weren't ready for Alabama ball, let's say, but would start at many other programs around the country. So it's a team that if, if you know, for them to be kind of the Cinderella story as the four seed doesn't really shake up, if you will, 
It, it doesn't jive uh, yet, uh, but here they are, and they are favored once again as they've been every game, I think, for two years since they lost to Georgia the last time they played. You know, just as a pure fan, Mark, watching Alabama play football and just appreciating Nick Saban, that's what we all have to do at this point, right? The greatness of Nick Saban and what he's doing. I feel like, you know, you just even if you're an analyst or you're, you're a Georgia football fan, take off that hat for a second and just appreciate what Nick Saban is doing. He's a once-in-a-generation type of coach, right? Sometimes it's hard to appreciate things when they're happening, but you're right. All I don't want to say we all love to see dynasties, but we talk about them an yeah. awful lot. You know, when the Cowboys had their dynastic run in the early 90s, you know, it was three championships in four seasons. And here we are, Alabama, almost a full decade since Nick Saban came on. It is a decade since he came on, but from 2009 when they won that first BCS championship till last year a chance to make it five, failed to do so against Clemson, now get another chance at five in nine years. These things don't happen often. He's now passing his mid-60s, probably got five, eight more good years that he may want to coach till he wants to hang it up. Who knows? So you do have to appreciate these things while they're happening, and, and oftentimes we don't. And what a job Kirby Smart has done with the Georgia Bulldogs as well. Taking down Baker Mayfield and OU, which is really fantastic in its own right, now they have a chance to take down Nick Saban and the Alabama Crimson Tide. What does Georgia need to do to get it done tomorrow night? Well, you know, they're going to obviously have to stop the run game of Alabama. They're going to have to force a turnover. You could, all these things I'm pointing out could go for either side right. because they're strength on strength. They're going to have to have a good start defensively. Oklahoma torched them in the first half, and it looked like it was going to be a short night for Georgia. Whatever Kirby Smart did, however he changed in the locker room, whatever he delivered at halftime, He's going to have to have that from the start. Going to have to execute. No mistakes. Right from the beginning, they were fortunate to get out of the Rose Bowl with a win. They deserve it, but they're going to have to have that the entire game against Alabama. Mark Kestisher, he's got a busy day tomorrow. College Football Playoff National Championship game. Appreciate the time, sir. It means Cam, a nice lot. Nice to meet you. Have Thank a good you one. Thank you so much. Joining us on the Cam Rogers Show here. we got plenty of guests coming at us here. We're going to keep them rolling in, and a lot of fun discussions coming at you. Dan Corso will be joining me in a matter of seconds. He's on his way over here, president of the Atlanta Sports Council, and they have done some fantastic work. Looking forward to discussing all of Atlanta right here with him because that's where we are. We're downtown in the Georgia World Congress Center here on Facebook Live. And here he is right now, Dan hey, Corso. How are we doing? Timing. Good. How are you? Absolutely. Nice Appreciate you. the time. Yeah, what a day. Yeah. What, what a weekend, weekend huh? Yeah, and yeah. what a what a night tomorrow night coming out of Yeah, here we are in the, uh, what we like to call the epicenter of college football, yes. Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and we have got a clash of titans uh, for sure lined up. And, and you can look around, you see just so many people coming out here and, and celebrating uh, the sport of college football and the culminating game in the epicenter. Uh, and somebody like you in a position that you are, it just must be awesome to sit back and look at everything and be like, this is awesome. Yeah, you know, we're really fortunate. Uh, as I run the Atlanta Sports Council, and our role is to recruit events like this to Atlanta. And then once we get them, we help organize and manage them. But there are so many great people and organizations uh, here in Atlanta that are involved in that process of recruiting the events and then putting them on that uh, we're really lucky to have uh, fantastic partners because it takes more than uh, one person uh, and one organization. It takes a lot because you know, sports events are very uh, beneficial to communities. I mean, you look around here, this is all visitors coming in uh, and spending money. So it's very lucrative uh, to a community, but also there's an energy and a social impact sure. that's created uh, the buzz and the excitement of having a big event like this. And then the, the attention of media like yourself. And uh, uh, it's just, it's, it's real competitive. Cities all over the country compete uh, for the right to host these events and we were really really fortunate back in November of 2015 when Bill Hancock uh, of the College Football Playoff named Atlanta as host for 2018. So the process of recruiting these kinds of events, you got the Super Bowl coming we up, yep. Ben's Final Four yep. as well, what do you go through to actually make that all happen? So uh, it's, a, it's a very organized process and we're actually in the middle for uh, a bid for the 2026 World Cup now uh, with the United Bid Committee on the North American bid. So we hope to have Atlanta uh, be a part of that equation should uh, our, our country's uh, bid uh, come to fruition in mm -hmm. 26. But so uh, the, the rights holder in this case, the college football playoff uh, will issue an RFP, uh, which is basically a document that states the requirements of hosting and their desire to see your 
pitch and your proposal uh, and your what your vision is and uh, and so you you react to that and you get you know the right people and the right companies around the, the table to analyze it and break it down and then it's a real defined set timeline of when you need to have certain things ready to go and every city does it a little bit differently but I, I think our approach is is turned to be pretty good so in terms of the title game tomorrow night, do you have any opportunity to kind of take a breath, or are you just always moving here? No, I, uh, well, I think, you know, we're the hosts, right? Yeah. And so we're the local boots on the ground uh, to the college football playoff. It's their event, yep. and we are their hosts uh, and bringing their party to our community, and we want to make it as special as possible. So you don't really ever take a, a rest, but you don't want to because it's exciting. I mean, I mean, we're talking about college football, right? Sure. And so down here, that is uh, beyond passion passionate and uh, you know it's really really uh, fun and, and cool to see it all come together I mentioned we were awarded the event in 2015 our bid process began in February of 2015 so it took almost that full calendar year to go through the bid uh, then be awarded and then in September of 2016 we started our host committee we launched it and we have about 13 uh, folks uh, on our committee uh, that are employed to kind of run the day-to-day -day operations and we've been going at it uh, daily ever since and working really closely with the folks at the college football playoff you know we've been roaming the grounds here and it's just amazing the passion that we get out of yeah. these georgia fans these alabama fans but particularly georgia there's a lot of them out yeah. there and just talk about atlanta as a city in terms of sports fandom because we talk about new york we talk about la boston atlanta pretty good sports city yeah thank you uh we were i think we're we were right up there with any city in the country because of the uh, the, the quantity, uh, it, it really becomes an entertainment value. And, you know, good cities have good uh, arts and culture and sports, and it's a great place to live when you have that mix. And we're certainly uh, certainly up there with our, with our choices of uh, prof professional and collegiate sports. Uh, we've got great annual events. Uh, and, you know, if you go through the, the list of uh, all sports, we've got just about everything here. We don't have a pro rugby team yet, but yep. maybe one day uh, we'll get that. So we're showing footage here of the collapse, if you will, the yep. Georgia Dome going down, and then you have the beautiful Mercedes-Benz Stadium. How about that transition, you know, taking one down and putting one up? Yeah, credit to Arthur Blank and Rich McKay and um, Mayor Reed here and Governor Deal uh, of the state of Georgia uh, for putting all that together. It's a fantastic example of a private partner, uh, private public partnership. And, you know, that building is without a doubt a game changer. Beautiful. Uh, when we were bidding on this event, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there was nothing but renderings and specs, drawings. It wasn't obviously had come to life. And now to see it to that point where we're uh, just over 24 hours away from kickoff is really exciting. And the World Cup potentiality would be very exciting as yeah. well. Yeah, it would be. Uh, we think we fit uh, right uh, nicely into that uh, formula of hosting a World Cup. Our Atlanta United franchise sure. is the top in the league. Uh, again, credit to Arthur Blank and Darren Eels and that leadership. Again, it goes back to the quality of Atlanta and um, our community to embrace uh, these events uh, as we organize them and then also embrace our teams. Dan Corso, president of the Atlanta Sports Council. How can we learn more about you guys? Uh, AtlantaSportsCouncil.com. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. There you have it. Appreciate Great. the time, Thank sir. Thank you Thanks so, much. so much. Appreciate, Appreciate it. Enjoy your time. Enjoy here. it. Yes. Thank you. Dan Corso, president of the Atlanta Sports Council, joining the Cam Rogers Show here on Chat Sports Facebook Live. Great conversation there with him. Many thanks to Mark Kestisher of ESPN Radio coming on the show as well. He will be doing some pregame and halftime and postgame talk for the college football playoff national championship game. Cam Rogers coming at you here. We are live at Playoff Fan Central. Very exciting stuff. Georgia, Alabama doing battle tomorrow night, but we're going strong here on a Sunday on Chad Sports. A lot to get to here today. We'll talk a little NFL, get some highlights in for you guys, and we have a conversation with one Rachel Lindsay that I'm going to toss to, the Bachelorette, of course, but doing a lot with the college football playoff as well. So let's send it on over. Hey, folks, Cam Rogers. Look who it is, Rachel Lindsay hey, alongside. Cam. How are we doing? <laughs> busy week for you. Busy, busy week, but so much fun. So excited to be here. Excited to be talking to you right now. Hey, yeah, that means a lot. <laughs> so talk about your week so far. You've been working with Extra Yard for teachers. You're a very passionate former substitute teacher yes. as well. So talk about the experience so far with them. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people are like, what is she doing here? Why is she here? But it, it's so great. So I'm a college football playoff foundation ambassador. And through that, we have the Extra Yard for Teachers initiative. And it's all about just uplifting teachers and, you know, encouraging them because we feel
feel like they're so underappreciated and it's about the teachers, it's about the teaching profession and it's about the students. And so I'm so honored to be a part of it because being here, it combines two of my passions, sports and sure. education. And I don't think a lot of people realize that the foundation is an arm of the playoffs and the championship weekend. And so I'm happy to be here as an ambassador spreading the word. So you got here on Wednesday. Yes. Minimal sleep. Yes. Are you hanging in there? I don't even know what day it is. <laughs> I just know I'm here, I'm talking to you, Cam, and I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. Hey, an exciting game as well tomorrow night, Georgia yes. and Alabama. And, yes. of course, they're students too, right? And they got to go through the education process as well. And think about it from a student-athlete perspective, in your opinion, just how tough do you think it is to kind of balance the athletics and the education at the same time? I think we don't talk enough about how hard that is for the guys. I mean, I just remember being in college and having a lot of student athlete friends. I say guys, girls too. Um, I remember having a lot of student athlete friends and I just remember the struggle of having to go to class and you know what kind of load that is sure. and having 12 hours a semester, but then having to go to practice and then if you want to, you know, perfect your craft, putting in more practice after that. I mean, it's really, really hard and I think it's a nice thing that, you know, we're doing to highlight because it's about the student athlete too sure. you know not just in secondary um, education it's about higher education too you've been bouncing around interacting with fans and all that yeah. what's the energy been like for you and going around and talking with the Georgia and Alabama faithful out there it's been so much fun I mean everyone keeps asking me who I'm cheering for I'm like listen Texas is my team they're not here I just want to see a good game but the fans are great Georgia and Alabama both we had a chance to attend media day and it was actually fun because you know everyone's asking sports related questions we're there to highlight the student athlete so it's been fun to ask the players who's your favorite teacher you know, what kind of impact did they have on your life? Same thing with the coaches. We were able to talk to them, too. So it's been great. You know what's interesting, Rachel? It seems like you are interested in everything. <laughs> Sports, <laughs> teaching, you're going through all of these interviews and stuff like that. I mean, it's really been a, an ultimate experience for you because you kind of get, yeah. get a little bit of everything throughout the process. Right? Absolutely. I mean, I like to consider myself a well-rounded individual. I would say that, yes. Yeah, but um, it's, it's so great. I mean, sports, education, who can't love those two right. things, you know? And education, of course, is, it's so important, and you got to start early with it, right, because exactly. that kind of sets you for the rest of your life. And, you know, I, I was personally going through some fantastic educational experiences, and it kind of helped me. Just how important is education, especially in terms of the early start, you know, grade school, all that stuff? I think that's a great question because in interviewing players and even – um, other sport broadcasters and, and the coaches this weekend, I have found that everyone talks about their elementary teacher sure. that made the biggest impact in their life. And so like that shows that it starts at an early age and it sets the foundation and it carries on into everything that you do in the future. And I think that that's what's so beautiful about the initiative that the Extra Yard for Teachers is doing because it's in the elementary classrooms that they're providing these makeovers and it's an experience that these children and the teachers won't forget. No doubt about it. And talking about teaching here, you see the results in life. And I mm -hmm. think that's the cool thing about teaching, too. Yeah. And teachers out there don't get a lot of respect sometimes. Teachers, we respect you. We love you. We love what you do. And I think that's kind of the beauty of the profession, right? You yeah. see the results right in front of you. Absolutely. And sometimes you don't. And it takes years. And yeah. I think it was interesting when I've been talking to people about their teachers, a lot of them still keep in contact with them now or their teachers have found them later or they've reached out to their teachers. And I think that's what's beautiful is seeing the results immediately, but then also seeing that they can come later on in the future and knowing that what you did planted a seed and it's been very rewarding to that student. And you're doing a great thing for the college football playoff. All right, Georgia, Alabama tomorrow night. Give yes. me a score prediction. Where are we feeling? Oh, I think it's going to be a low scoring game. I hate to say that. I want it to be high scoring. Um, I don't know. I think it's going to be close, or maybe I'm just saying I hope it's going to be close because I'm going to be there and I want to see You want entertainment. Game. I want to be entertained. Yes. Especially since I'm not pulling for anyone in particular. Absolutely. I just want to be entertained. No blowouts, nothing like that. You no. want a tight score. Yeah. If you had to pick a team, you go in Kirby Smart in Georgia or Nick Saban in Alabama? This is what I've been saying. I'm a Texas fan. Um, Georgia knocked off OU. Ooh. So... Um, I'll just leave it there. Okay. <laughs> I'll just leave it there. You fixed that puzzle out there, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Rachel Lindsay, the Bachelorette. By the way, big fan out there. Nick Penn Kayla, one of my good buddies. Do you mind giving him a shout out? Nick, what's up? Thanks so much for being a fan. I appreciate it. There you go. Rachel Lindsay here on the Cam Rogers Show and Chat Sports. Thanks so much, Rachel. Thanks for appreciate having me. It.
And many thanks for Rachel Lindsay to come on the program. A great chatting with her bachelorette, doing some fantastic stuff for the CFP. This is the Cam Rogers Show here on Chat Sports Facebook Live. I am live from the Georgia World Congress Center in Atlanta as we get you set for the college football playoff and national championship game tomorrow night. Alabama and Georgia doing battle. Many guests are flowing in here on the Cam Rogers Show. It's an open door policy. We let anybody come onto the set or come over here and chime in and give us their thoughts about the big time game and the atmosphere here as we have a guest rolling in right now, one Gary Stoken. People. Just came from uh, Orlando in the Central Florida Parade down at Disneyland. Hey, a lot warmer over there. I yeah, it is a lot warmer. It is cold here in Atlanta. Gary Peach Bowl, president and CEO. Thanks so much for coming. Oh, yeah. Happy New Year. Yes. Welcome to Atlanta. Happy New Year indeed. And Capital of college football. You got it. Hey, what a game tomorrow night. I tell you what, we've had since our bowl game last year with the semifinal, Alabama Washington was number one against number four. Started the season with one and three, Alabama Florida State. SEC championship was two, number two and six, Auburn, Georgia. Yep. Our game was number seven, 12, Auburn, UCF. And now we end the season with number one and num number two. How about it? I mean, if you're a college football fan in Atlanta, you are living right. No doubt about it. And the Peach Bowl, I mean, what a game that was. UCF, congratulations, they won the national championship. That's right. They're, they're hoisting the flag. They paid bonuses out. I saw Scott Frost this morning. He's all excited. Nebraska got a three-and-a-half-hour commercial. So, uh, yeah, it was good. You know, it's interesting. Scott Frost recently said to our own Tom, Tom Downey about the expansion that may come with the college football playoff at some point. Bill Hancock said recently, 18 playoff, not in the cards right now, but could you see it happening down the road? You know, I can. Here's why. Number one, the presidents don't want college football to move into the second semester. And if the conferences are going to keep their championship games, and then you had an eight-team or a 16-team playoff, you can't get it all in between final exams and Christmas. Yep. Number two, the players are 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. If you start going to an 18 playoff and a championship game in their conference, now you're playing an NFL schedule, and the kids aren't built physically for that. You know, at the end of the year, teams are beat up. Thirdly, the conference commissioners who run college football, their job is to hand as most money as they can back to the presidents. So they've got to make sure that that conference regular season schedule is important enough to the TV networks so they can get a big payout. If you start to diminish the regular season, which I think is the best in all of sports, because every game matters, then you diminish the rights fees that ESPN and CBS and Fox are going to pay, and that's going to diminish what yep. the conference commissioners are setting out to do. So for those three reasons, and the fourth is ESPN signed a 12-year deal with the, conference, with the CFP, uh, through 2025 to have a four-team playoff. So we have to wait a little, So at yeah, the very least. At best, at yeah. best. So, all right, so interesting thoughts there and a really great perspective on that. I do want to go back to Scott Frost, of course, who coached in that game for UCF. And I want to ask you, how cool is it to just kind of be a part of that undefeated season for the Knights? Well, it was great to see them play in uh, their championship game against Memphis and then to have them come in here. And they, this was Cinderella's chance to dance. Right? Yeah. They were undefeated. Group of five. Mike Oresco, the commissioner of the uh, American Athletic, kept talking about P6, the power six. The American Athletic is power six. Showing the highlights right here. And certainly in our game and two years before, Houston from the American Athletic came in to beat Florida State. So I think in one game, that's why they play the games. College football, anything can happen. Now, whether that would have happened if they played in the SEC West, or right. the SEC East or the ACC, who knows. But for that night, they were the better team. And, uh, you know, God bless them. They're 13-0, and undefeated. Now, you were instrumental in the creation of the Chick-fil-A kickoff game as well. That brings a lot of excitement right off the bat. How cool is that? Well, you know, it's, it's great to be a part of, of making Atlanta the college football capital and really having an impact on college football. You know, we reached out and brought the College Football Hall of Fame here in 2009, signed a 30-year license with the NFF. We brought the Chick-fil-A kickoff games on board in 2008, which has changed college football in that it's given the CFP a real key data point yep. on whether who should get in to the, to the college football playoff. And then to have, you know, 
the Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl elevate to the New Year's Six and host the semi every three years, and then to be a part of the team of Atlanta Sports Council, the ACVB, the Georgia World Congress Center, and the Atlanta Falcons to bring the national championship game here. It's been a great run for Atlanta. It has been a fantastic atmosphere here. Just kind of tell the folks at home how the experience has been for you walking around these grounds and seeing the Georgia and Alabama faithful. Well, it's funny. I, I, I love seeing families and I love seeing kids with their dads experience some of this stuff because who knows, same with the College Football Hall of Fame, who knows who's walking in there that one day will be inducted into that College Football right. Hall of Fame because they saw something or saw somebody or saw an event like the number one and number two, Alabama, Georgia, who knows what impact that has on the future in their life. So that's what really I get excited about. So in terms of the game tomorrow night, do you uh, have a prediction for us at all? What do you think, Georgia, Alabama, where are you leaning? Well, I typically root for guys that I know, and I know Nick and, and Kirby quite well. So I'm not gonna pick a winner. I just hope for Atlanta and college football, it's three overtimes, <laughs> and uh, so that's what I'll, I'll prognosticate. Gary Stoken, uh, Peach Bowl president and CEO, joining the Cam Rogers Show here on Chat Sports. Gary, really appreciate the time. Cam, great to be with you. Thanks, Thanks so, much. so much for having us, and welcome to Atlanta. Yes, enjoy the weekend and enjoy tomorrow night. Thank you, you too. All right, Gary Stoken joining the program here. And, uh, well, we got a lot more coming at you, plenty of interviews throughout the hour here as we take you up until 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And in, in Atlanta, Georgia, a lot of fandom here, not just Falcons fans, but we're talking Georgia fans, Alabama fans made the trip on over. And it's an intriguing matchup in many respects. You have the whole 11-0 stat. I'm sure you've heard that already. Nick Saban, 11-0 versus his assistants. And Kirby Smart, of course, a former assistant of Nick Saban, now the head coach of the Georgia Bulldogs. So a lot of storylines to follow there. Hey, we got NFL action as well. The NFL playoffs are going on. Just wrapped up the Jacksonville Jaguars and Buffalo Bills. We're going to recap yesterday's action first. So the Chiefs and the Titans did battle in what was John Gruden's last broadcast. Let's go to it. Let's get to the highlights here, and we'll start things off with a Kareem Hunt touchdown run. Look, the Chiefs did not use much of Hunt in this game, which was somewhat surprising. They used him there, though, for Kansas City to go up 7-0. Then, Travis Kelsey, touchdown reception. What a season for him. Chiefs are up 14-0. And then, second and 10, Marcus Mariota. A lot of concerns for him going into this game, and that made things worse. Marcus Peters with the interception in the mid-second quarter, still 14-0. Then Demarcus Robinson, how about this touchdown catch? He's into the end zone, 21-3 at the half, the Chiefs lead. Then Mariota is going to throw this pass here. This is like an ultimate highlight. Catches it eventually and then takes it back into the end zone for a score, 21 nothing. as we show you the replay. How about this? Slow-mo, boom, deflected. Hey, I'll just catch it. That's totally fine. Mariota goes into the end zone for the score. All right, Derrick Henry, 35 yards, 21-16 early in the fourth quarter. Do the Titans have a comeback in them? It's going to be Eric Decker here on the touchdown reception. Haven't said his name a lot this season, but a big-time play there. And then fourth and nine, Alex Smith firing downfield, and it's incomplete. So the Chiefs. Had to burn a lot of timeouts here. And then how about Mariota laying the block and Henry icing the game on that run on a third and 10. The Titans win a stunner, 22 to 21. And the Titans are moving on to the next round. We don't know who they will play yet. Oh, actually we do know because the Jacksonville Jaguars and Buffalo Bills finished. So the Jaguars are gonna go ahead and play the Pittsburgh Steelers while the Titans go on the road to take on the New England Patriots, your divisional round is set on the AFC side of things. Still some things to be figured out on the NFC side. But one game did go down last night. Atlanta taking on the Rams. The Falcons on the road. And we'll start things off with a Devontae Freeman touchdown run here to make things 13 to nothing. How about some help there from one Alex Mack at the center position. Had a fantastic year and is really continuing his elite play. All right, moving on. How about Robert Woods here? Diving catch that sets up the Rams in field goal range. A lot of 
playoff jitters in this one for the Rams, especially Jared Goff, but a fantastic play there by Robert Woods as we show you the replay. Then, this is going to be Matt Ryan, who fires downfield to one Mohamed Sanu, who goes 52 yards on this screenplay, and that will take things deep into the fourth quarter. Matt Ryan, though, is going to float this pass for one Julio Jones, who his numbers have not been very good in the red zone this year, but he gets it done here on the touchdown reception. Really a fantastic throw there by Matt Ryan. Ryan played really well in this game. This is a classic Matt Ryan flow, throw here. Off your back foot to Julio Jones. You trust one of the elite wide receivers in the league. All right, third and goal situation here for the Rams. Goff firing. That is a touchdown. But did he catch it? It was later reviewed. They're all celebrating and all that, but it wasn't a catch. We thought Tyler Higby had that one. He did not. So fourth and goal situation. Goff with time. Looking. Firing. Incomplete. Looking for Sammy Watkins there. The Rams lose at home. The greatest show on turf. 2.0. Couldn't get it done. They only had 13 points in that one. The Falcons will advance to the divisional round. Their opponent will be the Philadelphia Eagles. So they'll take on the Eagles in the divisional round, the number one seed in the NFC. The winner of the Saints and the Panthers, which will commence in a matter of moments, will be taking on that two seed, the Minnesota Vikings. But the Bills and Jaguars did battle today. Buffalo in the playoffs for the first time since 1999. Let's go to those highlights as we head to Everbank Field. Jags hosting a playoff game for the first time since the turn of the century in 2000. All right, second quarter we go. Nothing, nothing score. Jags defensive back Aaron Colvin tips it to himself on a wild interception. And big time turnover there for Saxonville, a team that has been ball hawking all year in the secondary as we show that replay of that fantastic interception. All right, still nothing, nothing. Calais Campbell barely gets a touchdown saving tackle on Tyrod Taylor here. How about this shoestring play? Just a little trip up and Tyrod Taylor falls to the ground. All right, fourth, fourth and goal situation here. Blake Bortles is going to hit. Ben Koyak on the back of the end zone for the game's only touchdown to make it 10-3 Jacksonville. Less than 30 seconds left. Jalen Ramsey picks off Nathan Peterman, who was in at the quarterback position there, to seal the win. The Jacksonville Jaguars will go ahead and take on the Pittsburgh Steelers in the divisional round as the Jags win at Jacksonville. A big time victory for them. 10 to 3. Your final score, a baseball score. Tyrod Taylor, 17 of 37, 134 yards and an interception. LaShawn McCoy went into this game, banged up, 19 carries, 75 yards in that one. Meanwhile, Blake Bortles was not very impressive. 12 of 23, 87 yards and one touchdown, but the Jacksonville Jaguars did just enough. But they're going to need to do a lot more in next week's game against the Pittsburgh Steelers. That I can tell you. Meanwhile, the Tennessee Titans will take on the New England Patriots in the divisional round. So for the most part, the playoffs are set. We are still awaiting the conclusion of the Saints and the Carolina Panthers. Once that concludes, then we will have the full playoff bracket for the divisional round, the winner of the Saints and Panthers. We'll take on the Minnesota Vikings and a weigh in for the folks at home. Do the Bills and Jaguars need quarterbacks for the 2018 season? Tyrod Taylor, Blake Bortles. Reports are that Blake Bortles is going to remain in Jacksonville, which is very interesting. So maybe they won't go out and grab a Kirk Cousins or any, anyone like that in the draft. Who knows? For the Buffalo Bills, though, we'll see what happens with Tyrod Taylor. I think the situation there is a lot shakier. So we are on Facebook Live. We want your comments flowing in. So be sure to chime in about the Bills and the Jaguars, respectively. Meanwhile, for the Panthers and the Saints, a very fun game. The third meeting between these two teams coming out of the NFC South, of course. So we want to hear your thoughts. Who wins in this one? Panthers or Saints? Give us a like for the Panthers, a heart for New Orleans. I think it's going to be a very fun game. Two physical teams that certainly know how to run the football. You got Cam Newton, though, where I have a lot of concerns. 
three interceptions in his recent performance against the Atlanta Falcons. He's going up against a pretty darn good secondary with Lattimore and Crowley for New Orleans. Cam has to be a lot safer with the football. His decision making obviously will have to be a lot better. And the run game for Carolina, I think it's going to have to take over in this game. So give us your votes. We got the Panthers, we got the Saints. Give us a like for the Panthers, a heart for the New Orleans Saints as we take you back here live to Playoff Fan Central. It's the Cam Rogers Show. We're in Atlanta getting you set for the college football playoff national championship game, Alabama and Georgia tomorrow night. And, well, we got a fun segment coming up after the break. James Yoder, the college football insider, will join me here on set. We are ranking the national champions of the 2000s. It's going to be fun. Keep it right here on Chat Sports. Welcome back to the Cam Rogers Show. I'm alongside the college football insider, James Yoder. James, some fun interviews today. Yeah, it's a great day. We've just been back to back to back with some great folks. Some folks that we don't usually talk to, guys yep. winning bowl games, people winning entire cities. You know, you talk to Dan about, Dan Corso, about uh, the Atlanta Super Bowl. They've got Final Four, they've got College Football Playoff. I don't know how they do it, but this is a great time. I'm having a lot of fun. Having a lot of fun indeed. A lot of passion out there, a lot of Georgia fans. More so than Alabama fans around the grounds, which is very interesting. We'll see how that kind of shakes out in terms of the stadium. So, James, in this segment here, we are ranking the national champions yep. of the 2000s, right? Yep. And, of course, we'll have a national champion tomorrow night. But we'll start off here with Alabama, and we're ranking them here. What do you think about Alabama in, in terms of this team with A.J. McCarron and Trent Richardson and Dante Hightower ranking at number 18? Yeah, I'm going to pull up my computer here, Cam, join you here. So the reason we put this team at number 18, which means this is your worst national championship champion since the turn of the century, Cam. The 2011 and, team. And that's got to say a lot. And I will say this. The team that wins this game tomorrow night in Atlanta, Georgia, Alabama, I think could replace them as the worst team. And no wow. offense to those teams, but those teams don't have the star power of almost any of these national titles. And the Alabama team tomorrow night will have the same as this Alabama team did here. They didn't win their conference cam. And this team here needed a rematch against a team that had already beat them in the regular season in LSU. And so that's why we ranked them the worst. And not necessarily, I wouldn't put it as the worst team necessarily if you put them head to head in a time zone or a, you know went on time machine but i would say the body of their work was the worst no conference champion and you had to have a rematch against a team that already beat you to get that title no team has ever got that opportunity in the in the uh, since 2000 so that's why we put them at number 18. and we could take our time with all these teams and really give a good analysis here james spend about a minute per team for the folks at home if you're waiting for each team to kind of pop up here so 2011 Alabama, 12-1 and one on the season, though, James. And Nick Saban, it kind of feels weird to put a Nick Saban coach team last. Yeah, well, I mean, I think We're that, game, hairs. Yeah, that game in early November against LSU, it was a game that Alabama just had a litany of errors. They missed multiple field goals they should have made inside 40 yards. And it was an ugly game, Cam. I'm not sure how well you remember this one, but... In their defense, they did get the opportunity to come back and have uh, the ability to play LSU again and completely outman them. They won 22 to nothing in that game. It was one of the more boring games in national championship history. But I think it's the no conference champion, and it's not like this year's Alabama team where you're playing a team that you never got a shot to play. They had their shot against LSU, a team in your conference, and for some reason, you know, the BCS still put them 1-2, which I disagreed with at the time. Mm. I totally did. And, you know, they beat LSU. I really think LSU kind of a job out of a title that year. You beat a team in your conference in your own division, and you've got to play them again. I, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. We are ranking the national champions of the 2000s, checking in at number 18, the 2011 Alabama squad. Next on the list at number 17, LSU of 2007, Les Miles against Ohio State University yeah. took down the Buckeyes in that game. Yeah, and so... Why this so low for this team? This is the only team, Cam, that's won a national championship in the modern era of college football with two losses, right? And so you see what we do, all of our college football shows, we always talk about one loss 
you're in trouble. Two losses, you are done. And there is a reason for that. It's because it's almost impossible to win a national championship. Now, Auburn was a win in the, in the SEC championship game away from getting into the playoff with two losses. But it still hasn't happened in the playoff era. It only happened once in the BCS era of almost 20 years, and that was in 2007 with LSU. They got a chance to take on an Ohio State team that had lost a couple of weeks prior themselves. But they lost two games, both in overtime, to Arkansas and Kentucky. And one of the weaker teams, and one of the weaker years in college football teams I can ever remember. And that's why LSU is 17 on our list of the you know, power ranking the national champions in the 2000s. Was OSU overrated at number one? Oh, abso then? absolutely. So here's what happened that year, Cam. Ohio State was not considered a national championship team to start the year. They were the top six, seven, eight, yeah. but they lost so much in that 0-16 that lost to Florida, back-to-back -back losses to the national champions that there were teams like Rutgers, South Florida, that, that were ranked number two at one point in the year. West Virginia lost the last game of the year, uh, their last game of the year when they were ranked number one. And Ohio State and LSU, going into the final weekend of the year, they were out of the camp. It took a multitude of upsets in that final weekend in conference championship play to get them back to the top. Ohio State was just the only team that had one loss, right? But they lost to a very weak Illinois team that year. All right, so the 2007 LSU squad ranking in as number 17. So if you're just joining us here on the Cam Rogers Show, we are alive in Atlanta, the Georgia World Congress Center. We're breaking down, of course, the college football national championship game that will commence tomorrow night. But we are right now ranking the national champions of this millennium. So we've been through a couple of teams. So Alabama of 2011 and then LSU of 2007, 18, and 17, respectively. Let's go into number 16 to the 2003 LSU squad, coached by one Nick Saban. Yeah, well, Nick Saban. Uh, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of uh, consistency in the bottom of this list, Cam. It's a couple of LSU teams that. I don't know what to say to these teams. There's no redeeming quality by either of those LSU teams. And then, of course, the uh, the Alabama team didn't win their conference. So this is Nick Saban's first national title, 2003. And the thing about this, Cam, if he wins a national title tomorrow night, you know that's going to be six since 2003 for LSU, five at one school and one at his third stop as a head coach uh, at LSU. So a few people know this. He's been a head coach at four different schools, LSU, Alabama, Michigan State, and the University of Toledo, my alma mater. There you go. A few people know that. So. They won a game against uh, against Oklahoma in the BCS championship game. But the reason we rank them so low is because this is the only split national title of the modern you know, BCS and CFP area. Why was that? Because the computer formula said that, hey, number one USC has too weak of a strength of schedule, and because of that, we are not going to keep them in the national title game. USC would have wiped the floor with this LSU team that year, and so that's why we rank them so low. It's not because of anything they did in the championship game. It is that the best team didn't get a chance to beat them. All right, 2003 LSU checking in at number 16. How about number 15 now? The Florida Gators of 2006, coached by one Urban Meyer. So we're talking about some brand-name coaches here. Yeah, and so what they needed to do to get in this game, this is if they were not not of beat Ohio State 41-14 to in that national title game, Cam, they would have potentially been ranked last, maybe second to last because of uh, Alabama not winning a conference title. So this Florida team came out of nowhere. No one was pegging in the last two or three weeks of the season. It was more of a Michigan-Ohio State-USC year. Michigan lost to Ohio State, but stayed at number two. And then USC on the final weekend of the year lost to in-state rival uh, UCLA before they even had a Pac-12 championship at that time, the Pac-10. And so that opened the door for the voters to say, hey, number four Florida just crushed it in the SEC title game. We're going to jump them over number two Michigan, put them in there. And then Ohio State was sitting fat and happy, did not prepare well for the game, and Florida absolutely ran them. But other than that national championship game, uh, there wasn't necessarily anything redeeming about that Florida team, so that's where we put them, where we have them, at 15. Yes, the Florida Gators there at number 15 out of 18. Let's get to number 14 now. Another Alabama squad, this one from 2009, took down number two, Texas. 37-21, of course, head coach by Nick Saban again. Yeah, Nick Saban. So I don't. I feel like Alabama fans are going to walk by and like throw egg at our screen because we keep ranking. I'm their a little teams, worried. Their team's so low, but nevertheless, this team had great players, Cam, and it was Nick Saban's third year uh, at the school. But when we looked at the totality of where they ranked in the season, kind of their offensive and defensive output, strength of schedule, that all looked good. But what took it for us is that they played a Texas team that lost their starting quarterback, Colt McCoy, in the first quarter, and his backup was a true freshman and they still almost beat Alabama right so that's one thing that took them down a notch and then the second thing is 
almost the team that everybody thought was number one this year was Oklahoma. And there was this little weird thing that happened. Oklahoma beat Texas head to head. But, you know, they, you know, Oklahoma beat Texas, all this stuff. All these different things happened, Cam, and the wrong team got in the national title game. It was kind of, kind of just kind of – So uh, it was the wrong pairing. The wrong eyes. pairing. I think Oklahoma was probably the better team in college football that year. All right, so the 2009 Alabama squad there at number 14. Number 13 now, 2010 Auburn, Cam Newton. Not getting much respect from you in your this, ranking. This this is just mine. We had, this, we went Democratic. Everyone had the opportunity okay. to talk about these, so we've all got to own them at this point. So – not necessarily at the time the star power, but some of these guys like Michael Dyer and Nick Fairley came out to be better players, I think, long term than they were expected to be at the beginning of that season. But this is all about it being really the only one-man national title we've ever seen. Cam Newton came in, played college football for just one season as a starter in 2010. After two years at Florida as you know, when Tim Tebow's backup, sure. uh, got kicked out of there, went down a level, and then returned. And if it was not for him, this was really an 8-4 and four team. It really was. They had to come down 20-plus points down to Alabama to win the national title game, this, or to, to advance the SEC title game to get a chance to play in the national title game. And they had a very a rudimentary remediary performance against Oregon in that title game. Power ranking the national champions of the 2000s, the Auburn Tigers of 2010 at number 13. Let's move along in our rankings here. Number 12, the Oklahoma Sooners going 13-0. Bob Stoops there as the head coach getting things done in a baseball score in the national title game. Yeah, so another one of those things where the quarterback gets hurt. Chris Winkie, Florida State's quarterback, they might have been the better team, was injured. They put some guy named I think, Marcus Outson. I forget his name. That's how long ago and how uh, insignificant he was in the grand scheme of college football. And they, they played a brutal game. We see that championship score, 13-2. to two. Florida yeah. State could only you know get a safety. And so you rank him a notch lower for that one. And this is the team just didn't have that great of players. They didn't dominate the, the way that you expect them to be inside the top ten. All right, so the Oklahoma Sooners at the turn of the century checking in at number 12 in our power rankings. As we move along, it gets better, folks. It gets more impressive. Let's go to number 11 here. 2002 Ohio State Buckeyes, 14-0 record, beating the Miami Hurricanes. That's always a good thing. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, they're – you got to look at sometimes undefeated. We have that uh, yeah, the Alabama team, the Auburn team ranked lower. Ohio State's an undefeated team. Not that many undefeated teams, by the way. We're going to see a lot of one-loss teams yeah. uh, in this rankings. But if you think about this Ohio State team, Cam, there are so many games they could and should have lost. I just want to kind of review this for you. The national title game had to go into multiple overtimes to win against Miami. Now, a great Miami team, so you should get a lot of credit for that one. But they had multiple games throughout the year they potentially could and should have lost, including a Purdue game where they went for it down, uh, down uh, four points points I believe with under 30 seconds on a fourth and one play threw it up to the end zone score touchdown could have been a loss there how about five times the year where they were down big in the in the fourth quarter and came back to win all right so 2002 Ohio State Buckeyes there at number 11 let's get to number 10 James I was here for this one 2015 Alabama Crimson Tide getting it done they're there at number 10 taking down Clemson in a very entertaining game Cam do you remember the quarterback of that team was uh yeah not very notable. <laughs> yeah, well, so we've got uh, we've got a lot of uh, a lot of people remember that game for being a great game. But I think that team. I want to say Coker. Jacob Coker. Yes, I was go. waiting for someone to say it, but Jacob Coker as the quarterback of that team. Nothing uh, anyone remembers. I kind of threw it out there because I had to think about it for a second. I just didn't have my notes right in front of me. But All the commenters are ready. They were ready to roll <laughs> with that one. I saved you all at home. I got you. Yeah, so, I mean, this team uh, in, in 2015, you know, Nothing again. They had the Heisman Trophy winner, and that's uh, that's notable. But they didn't necessarily dominate the year in, in college football in 2015. We know it's offense, 30th ranked offense, third best defense. Now, very difficult to strength the schedule that year in 2015. So I think it's about right. Middle of the pack champion. They didn't have a legendary team by any means. So we got them right in the middle. So we are power ranking the national champions of the 2000s. We are live here on Chat Sports at the Georgia World Congress Center. Cam Rogers alongside the college football insider James Yoder. We're getting you set for the big game tomorrow night. James, a lot of enthusiasm, excitement out there for sure. There's a lot of enthusiasm. It's a Georgia crowd though. Now, yes. Cam, you and I went to get lunch earlier and we finally saw a place where it kind of evened out. The sports bar uh, right across the street. We ran over there, got some uh, food for the crew here, and it was maybe 70-30 Georgia, 60-40 maybe. There was a lot more Alabama fans outside here than there are from the thousands that are inside the Georgia World Congress Center.
All right, let's get into single digits here in terms of our power rankings. Number nine, 2003 USC Trojans. Yeah, now this team was the best team that year, Cam. That's why they're ranked higher than the other 2003 LSU team. They beat number four Michigan in the Rose Bowl, and it should have been by 40 points. I was at that game, Cam. It was a complete domination by USC. They took their foot off the gas a little bit. Second half, number one ranked team in the AP. Only loss was a very narrow loss on the road against one Aaron Rodgers and Cal. But Reggie Bush, Matt Liner, two Heisman Trophy winners, Mike Williams, they had a stacked team. All right, so there are the Trojans there at number nine. Let's look at number eight, 2014 Ohio State Buckeyes. Urban Meyer and company getting it done against Oregon. That was never a game. We had not, not much of a game. I, I kind of expected that one to uh, turn in the second half. I'm like, where's Oregon going to, yeah. you know, with Marcus Mariota, where's that 40-point outburst in the, burst in the second half going to happen? But this one, Ohio State dominating team talent-wise, Cam, and they really crushed it in the playoffs. The Big Ten Championship game, 59 nothing, really took, took on and beat down an Alabama team that most people predicted to win the national championship when Correct. it started that playoff. And then Oregon, a dominating performance down the stretch with their third-string quarterback in those three games and those postseason games. Never seen anything like it in the history of college football. Lost their starting quarterback, Braxton Miller, uh, early in the year before the season started. Had one loss to Virginia Tech in September and then dominated the rest of the year. That's why they're you know, ranked here over an undefeated Ohio State team we just saw a couple moments ago. So there's Ohio State from 2014. Let's take a look at number seven now, the Clemson Tigers of 2016 taking down Alabama. Yeah, so they took down uh, this Alabama team and they had their loss as well. They could have a second loss this year, but talented team uh they got the we get probably the i don't know cam what about you that game i think with the usc texas game the 2005 season the second best game maybe i ever saw in college football it was a huge symbolic win a too. very symbolic win kind of eliminated the word clemsoning which became a, sure. a verb for about a decade time frame which meant hey we're supposed to win this game or we have a big lead or whatever it is and took it down tons of talent on that team and what's most impressive about this team i think you you bookend that with a championship loss and then another playoff appearance kind of proves the level of talent this team had and the way they dominated that season i think that game james really signified to us how big of a gamer Deshaun Watson really is. Phenomenal. And we're seeing it in the NFL, of course. I, I, he got hurt, but still. Drafted number 12, that was surprising. I would have taken him in top five. I mean, that's, I guess, why I'm not a GM. <laughs> Maybe that's why I should be. 2016, Clemson Tigers there at number seven. We're power ranking the national champions of the 2000s. Number six, the 2008 Florida Gator squad, Urban Meyer at the helm. This is a dominating team cam this is you know if not for a couple of losses they had one regular season loss this year and then they lost the sec title game the next year if they eliminate those two losses go on and win back to back i mean we could be talking about the greatest kind of you know snapshot of a, of a four-year stretch 06 08 09 uh for florida got the two titles 06 no way ultimately lost that alabama team that won defeated in uh in 2009 but what a team percy harvin you had tim tebow this team rolled now that one loss is keeping them out of the top five. It really is. It was just a disappointing uh, outcome. But after that one, they rolled from there into the national title game, beat Oklahoma, and that was kind of the uh, that was the end of it. All right. So the Gators there at number six, number five now. The 2013 Florida State Seminoles, of course, Jameis Winston, Lamarcus Joyner and Devontae Freeman, all brand names in the NFL right now, James. Yeah, so let's talk about this team. Not a team people were considering to be a national championship you know, contender maybe at the beginning of the year. Not even uh, you know, one that people would say, oh, could get a chance. Uh, because who are you starting? A redshirt freshman, Jameis Winston. Decent recruit, but had never taken a snap. They got out of the, uh, out of the gate cam and just dominated from the first snap of the year and they did it every single week going all the way down the stretch a little bit closer of a championship game against Auburn than I would have expected but an undefeated team a team that was first in defense second in offense that's the only team you're going to see on here that dominated this much on both sides of the ball and there's that national title there for Jimbo Fisher so the Florida State Seminoles at number five number four another Alabama team this one with Eddie Lacy and Amari Cooper and HaHa -Ha Clinton Dix playing safety in the NFL. Some big time names there. And what a victory it was over Notre Dame, James. I remember watching the game stunned. Yeah, I mean, gosh, Notre Dame thought they were going to win that game, yeah. which, which was more of an interesting, funny joke than, 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 than anything else. But they completely dominated that team that, that day, Cam. The one thing that holds this team back from maybe being uh, above it is that one loss, of course, that's going to take them back. But also, there's people out there who think that Ohio State was the best team that year and may have won. Ohio State was on probation, didn't get the opportunity to play, but 
the offense in that team, I mean, they were just overwhelming, Cam. Amari Cooper, as you said, Eddie Lacy, uh, the quarterback play from A.J. McCarron, the best defense in the country, a great strength and schedule, and that blowout victory in the championship game is kind of what puts them, you know, maybe if some other teams, five, six, seven, eight, thought they had a chance to be at this number four spot, this is what gets them, that dominating performance over a Notre Dame team that was undefeated and ranked number one. Exactly, yes. Manti Teo and company there, 2012 Alabama squad ranking number four in our national champion of the 2000s power rankings. Let's move along to number three. James, when you say Texas and USC, everybody and their mother knows what you're talking about. Yeah, I would hope so. I would <laughs> hope so. If you don't, you need to go uh, you go check that out. But this is probably the only team on this list, this list, Cam. When the ball was kicked off for the national title game, no one in the entire stadium that wasn't wearing their uniform ever thought they had a chance to win. And they did, and it was in such an impressive fashion that they kind of came back. That drive, Vince Young on fourth down, you know, skirting up and you know down right at the corner in the right side of the end zone to get that winning touchdown over a USC team that was considered maybe the best ever, was going to win their third national title in four years, back-to-back -back Heisman Trophy winners. They had everything going on, dominant defense. And then this Texas team who sat there in their hotel for two weeks in Pasadena, hearing everyone discredit them, saying they had no chance. Best offense in America, top 10 defense, pretty strong strength of schedule, and they slayed the Dragon Cam. And if you look back, if you kind of eliminate what you had in your mind, you look at their whole season, that's why they're number three. It's the, the victory, but their whole season was just a series of dominant blowouts. In terms of the coaches of the 2000s, James, I do want to ask you, Mac Brown, where is he at in the rankings? Uh, I, definitely in the top 10 for sure. I think there's, a, there's an outside chance he could make the top five or six. And I'll tell you why. A national championship, another national championship he had, uh, a game where he lost, and then he was in the top five or so for pretty much the first eight or nine years of the, uh, the decade. After, the, after that loss uh, to Florida, I'm sorry, to Alabama, they went downhill for four years. So that kind of drops him off there, but certainly in the top 10, maybe five, six, seven. We are live here in Atlanta, Georgia, the Georgia World Congress Center. It's the Cam Rogers Show on site, getting you ready for the college football playoff national championship game. Cam Rogers alongside one James Yoder, the college football insider. We are power ranking the national champions of the 2000s. We just did number three. Let's spend some time here with two and one, James. Let's get to two, the 2004 USC squad. Oh my gosh, Cam. I, I, I wish you were a decade older because you would just be drooling over remembering this team as an older. You weren't that young, but this team was phenomenal. And they were even better in 05, to be frank, where they lost the game. They lost the championship there at the end. They went in and made this Oklahoma team that was number two that most people thought it was an even matchup going into. It was like watching uh, the Patriots play a high school team. That's how bad they dominated that team that, that year. Top six offense, as you see there, number six. Top you know, rated defense, number three in the country. Decent strength of schedule at fifth, right? That's that's as probably as good as it gets for a combination of strength of schedule, offense, and defense. The highest in trophy bat liner, that may be one of the better quarterback years we've seen out of a quarterback. And I, I just can't say enough about how good this team was. If you were to have that time capsule of playing these teams all in, I think this team would definitely beat all the teams we talked about uh, so far. I struggle between the team uh, at 2004, number two, USC, and the team we're going to put at number one just because the amount of players, the amount of talent, and then also the dominating victory in the national title game that that number one team had that we'll talk about here in a second. Let's get to that number one team, James. The number one team, best national champion of the 2000s, the Miami Hurricanes of 2001, Clinton Portis, Jeremy Shockey, Ed Reed. We all know who they are. Yep. James. What a game it was. I mean, so let's talk about the depth on that team, Cam. So you had Jeremy Shockey as your tight end. You had sophomore Kellen Winslow, who barely played. He got some special teams. And a year after this was a first-round draft pick as his backup, right? You had Ed Reed as uh, as your starting safety. You know who, who his backup was? It was Sean uh, Taylor, the uh, the safety who was also a first-round draft pick. Uh, rest in peace. But went on to an All-American season the year after that. Uh, Clinton, uh, Willie McGahee was your backup running back. Right? I mean, the talent on this team was phenomenal. Clinton Poor's backed up by Willie McGahee. And also, uh, one more player, the NFL guy, I'm just forgetting his name, Frank Gore is on that team ah. also. The third string running back. Uh, Walter Reed's, uh, Walter Payton's son was the fourth string running back. I mean, just the immediate... Uh, uh, 
embarrassment of riches. They beat a couple top 10, top 25 teams in the last month of the season. Something like 59 nothing, 66-7. I'll have to pull up the schedule here. Such a dominating performance, Cam. You have no idea. Then went and played a Nebraska team in the title game that they waxed off the field. 37-14. It wasn't even that close. It's something like 31 nothing at halftime. All right, the 0-1 Canes of Miami ranking number one right there. All right, folks, we're wrapping up the Cam Rogers Show here today. James, we're not done yet, though. We got more programming coming tomorrow. Well, we've got Cam Rogers Show two-hour special tomorrow right here on Chat Sports. Then coming back in the afternoon, we've got a college football special previewing the championship game, talking a little about 2018. Might even sneak into 2018 top 25. You never know. Stay but tuned. We'll at least go over the top 10. No promises yet, but tomorrow's going to be awesome. All right, folks. Until then, enjoy your evening, and we'll see you.